Well, let's go ahead and get started. Apologize for the late delay. I think we were waiting on uh, the moderator to come and introduce me, but since she's not here, I'll just introduce myself. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Pilar Thomas. Uh, I'm of counsel with the law firm of Lewis Roca Rothgerber Christie, based out of Tucson, Arizona. We're a uh, Southwest law firm, uh, and I'm out of the tribal lands and natural resources practice group, where I do a lot of work on tribal energy, tribal economic development, some gaming, not much, mostly, mostly the regulatory side, um, and other tribal law, uh, tribal governmental related uh, legal work. Um, just a little bit of my background. Um, the law is my second career. Um, when I graduated from University of New Mexico School of Law, uh, I went and worked at the U.S. Department of Justice in the Indian Resources section. Uh, where I practiced uh, Indian law, represented the United States in treaty rights cases, water rights cases, um, land into trust cases. Um, I left there, went to go work for my own tribe. I'm a member of the Pascoyaki tribe, which is out of Tucson, Arizona, uh, where I was attorney general for my tribe for a couple years. Tribal politics being what they are, I soon found myself in private practice um, and actually joined the firm of Lewis and Roca uh, at the time. Uh, where I practice a lot of tribal gaming work, uh, representing tribes in California and Arizona. Um, I was then appointed as Deputy Solicitor for Indian Affairs in the first term of the Obama administration. So I was in the Department of the Interior um, as Deputy Solicitor uh, for about a year and a half. And then from there, went to the Department of Energy, where I was appointed as Deputy Director of the Office of Indian Energy Policy uh, and programs. And with two years before the end of the term, the secretary came in and said, you stick it out for two years or go. So I said, okay, I'm going. So I went home. Um, so I've been home now for about five years. And as I said, practicing in Indian energy, um, environmental law, economic development, etc. So I've been asked to talk to you today about um, what we like to call kind of this legal and regulatory pre-positioning of land development and natural resource uh, development. Uh, I gave this uh, presentation a couple of years ago in Spokane. Um, how many folks were here, were in, at the Spokane conference? So a handful, anybody, did you see it last time? Did you, did you come see me two years ago? No, maybe? Okay, well, it's not much different. I'll, I'll, I'll update us on Trump administration policies. A couple of years ago, we weren't quite sure exactly what was gonna be going on, now we know. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what, the what I see the Department of Interior doing around uh, land development, which is unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, not, not much. Um, so an overview. Really the goal here is to look at this through the tribal lens. So as a tribal government that has sovereign authority and control over your land and your resources, um, what are the kinds of things that tribal governments can and should be thinking about regulating? Uh, asserting that and using that authority and that control. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the typical types of legal and regulatory schemes or what I call legal infrastructure um, for land and natural resource development. Um, looking at federal schemes tribal schemes, and state and local government schemes. And the reason why I like to kind of talk about what other governments do is because, frankly, there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. So if we see a model of regulatory scheme that looks like it works, whatever that means, then why start from scratch? Why not adopt another government's model if it works? So it could be the federal government. There are actually some pretty good practices that the federal government has around managing its own land. Um, there's also lots of examples of what tribes themselves are doing. Uh, and then state and local governments also have uh, an example, I think, for us on how to uh, structure the legal infrastructure to support our goals around land and natural resource development. Um, I also want to kind of go through the, what the major benefits are, of course, of doing this before you begin development. One of the things I see, I do a lot of lease negotiations for tribes. Um, 
Uh, and I've seen a lot of leases when I was at the Department of Interior. One of my responsibilities was to work with the solicitors in the field and the BIA people in the field to review big, especially big leases. So the first big number of solar leases, for example, that came out of the Southwest ended up making their way uh, to my office for review. And one of the things that I've seen is kind of a regular pattern, which is a little concerning to me as a lawyer, is that we tend to regulate through the lease. So unlike many governments who have a regulatory law and then everybody's got to comply with the law, tribes seem to instead regulate through the lease. So they put these regulatory mechanisms into the lease terms. Um, which is okay, except if somebody starts violating your regulatory scheme, now you got a breach of lease, and you have a whole different way to resolve that issue than if you said, hey, you're violating my law. You have to comply with my law. And that's, again, a different way to exercise our sovereignty. We exercise our sovereignty by, being, by doing what sovereigns do, pass laws, regulate behavior. We could contract for that behavior, and that's what we do when we regulate through the lease, or we could say everybody's got to behave like this. And instead of having a project by project um, discussion around what kind of regulations you want to have, you have consistent regulations, which is fair to everybody. Um, so you have the, these benefits of establishing this legal infrastructure beforehand. The other big benefit is transparency. So if you want to attract outside businesses, if you're looking to do large scale retail development, for example, or you're looking to do large scale energy development, uh, something where you're more likely to have an outside party uh, come in and, and actually do the project and maybe even own the project, um, you want people to be able to see what your law is before they engage with you. We don't really want to hide the ball, we don't have to. We don't have to really hide what we, what we want to try and do. So by pre-positioning and putting this legal infrastructure in place ahead of time, people can see. And, and business loves nothing more than certainty. So if they're certain about what the law says and a little bit more certain about what it means, then they're going to be more incentivized to invest because they know what the law is. When they don't know what the law is, then they won't invest. So there's other benefits uh, by being able, again, to, for example, attract outside, uh, outside investment. Um, how do we develop this legal infrastructure during our planning process? How many folks here already have a master land plan or master land use plan? So a good number, not most, um, but a good number. But as you're going through that planning process of what do we want to use our land for, and starting to draw lines on the map for housing and for industrial and for the gaming enterprise and for agriculture, whatever we can use our land for. Um, once we understand what we want to use it for, then marrying up, developing the legal infrastructure that supports that plan lets you do them at the same time so that you don't have a law that runs contrary to what your land use goals are or vice versa or vice versa. And then I'll end with some best practices and other practice models. I'm going to talk throughout this a little bit about, for example, the Hearth Act. How many folks here are familiar with the Hearth Act? So most everybody. So, so um, you know, 45 tribes, almost 50 tribes now have Hearth Act regulations. How many tribes here have Hearth Act regulations? So three. Okay, everybody should have Hearth Act regulations. Is that hard? Just find and replace. Go into the secretary's regulations. Find secretary, replace with the name of your tribe, copy it, and send it in. It's easy. Literally, it's that easy. But, um, but it's the ultimate, uh, for, at least from a surface leasing standpoint, um, it's the ultimate, for us it should be, the ultimate in what we're really trying to accomplish, which is getting the BIA out of our processes. Who here is from the BIA? I checked with the BIA table to see if there are any realty people here. There aren't? Okay, good. So I can talk about them. Um, okay, so what type of development activities are we, are we talking about here? Well, we, of course, have planning and policy making. Um, so just like any big thing, and, and when I was at the Department of Energy, the one thing I would always say to tribes is, don't come in here with a bunch of project ideas. Come in here with a plan. And if you don't have a plan, ask me and I'll help you with a plan. So we provided a lot of technical assistance to tribes to help them develop energy plans, 
Um, planning, of course, you guys know how important it is. It keeps you on track, it keeps you focused. Um, and from a policy perspective and recognizing that tribal leadership changes, so just like any other government, policies will shift and change. But at least if you have a plan in place and maybe have solidified some policies, you get some institutional uh, momentum going to keep, it, to keep it going. So you don't have a, a necessarily a fit and start. Other types of development activities, conducting an environmental assessment. Especially if you're looking at using land that you know you're going to have environmental impacts. And whether the BIA is involved or not, if you're leasing or not, or doing it right away, doesn't really matter. You still want to try and understand what are going to be the environmental impacts of this type of land use, of this type of development. Um, site assessment, so a very specific place um, as part of your development activities. Certainly a resource assessment. So if I'm doing an energy resource, what kind of energy resources do I have? Is it wind? Is it sun? We all have sun. Is it wind? Is it biomass? Do I have some geothermal out here? Do I have some oil and gas? What do I have? Um, if it's other natural resources, right, you're doing this assessment. If you're a, if a timber tribe, you've got a timber management plan. Um, you may or may not have an agricultural management plan, depending on if the tribe is running the farm or if you're leasing out your land. Um, certainly, you're trying to take a look at your economic costs and benefits. So this is all part of the development uh, activity. Um, you're looking at what kind of infrastructure you have. If I'm trying to develop housing, if I'm trying to do an industrial site development, I've got to have infrastructure there, I've got to have electricity, I might have to have natural gas, I certainly have to have roads. So I've got an inc infrastructure aspect to this, an infrastructure build out. Um, and then lastly, of course, I'm constructing whatever it is from a project standpoint that I'm trying to do. So almost, you know, the order, the ideal order in which we would go from planning to uh, shovel in the ground uh, in terms of the types of things that we're looking at. And each of these can and should be controlled to a great extent by policies and even to a certain extent by laws. So tribes, of course, have relatively simple, uh, at this stage, there are some tribes that have incredibly complex legal systems, legal infrastructure. Navajo Nation, for example, has, I think, five titles. They're each a 1,000 pages long. So a very robust and active tribal government in Navajo to adopt tons of laws that, that address a whole bunch of stuff. Um, a lot of other tribes have uh, maybe not as complex, but certainly um, almost as comprehensive. But for the most part, my experience has been that most tribes really have kind of a bare minimum, and especially when it comes to land use and land development. We all have criminal codes. We all have court codes. We almost all have some civil codes. If we're doing gaming, we all have gaming ordinances. Um, so we have some of that key stuff. We might even have some laws that are associated with gaming that we've had to adopt because of the, what the banks require us to do. So we might have, or the compacts require us to do. So in California, um, the tribes have to have an env environmental review ordinance. Um, so you know they're forced to go through a formal tribal environmental review process if they want to develop gaming projects in the state of California under those gaming compacts. They have torque ordinances, they have, they have to, everybody's got adopt building codes. So we might see kind of this tribal ordinance development that we see around specific types of development. But for the most part, even then, it's specific to that development. So even in California, where these tribes have to have an environmental review ordinance to do environmental review for gaming, most tribes actually limited just to the gaming. So if they're going to do other development on their lands, that environmental review ordinance doesn't apply to that development. It only applies to the gaming. So there's opportunities here for us to take a look at kind of what do we have in place. We, of course, have to look at our constitutional authorities. Everybody's got a slightly different one. Even when they're supposed to be cookie cutter, they're all, some of them require the secretary to approve stuff. Some of them don't even say specifically that a tribe can take action around land. Some people have general councils where they have to go to their general membership. Other people have just regular executive business committees. 
Other people don't even have a constitution. So we want to understand kind of what our organic law allows us to do, um, what our organic law covers, uh, and then what kind of ordinances, what kind of laws might be in place, and then what might we be missing based on what it is we want to do and based on what our value system is, what our concerns are, what our policy might be. On the federal side, we have a whole host of federal laws that, of course, apply if we've got the BIA in the middle of it, which is for most of us, since I only saw a handful of heart attacks, hands go up. But we certainly have, for example, the Indian Reorganization Act, which allows us to, first of all, form governments, second of all, form corporations. Um, we have the Long-Term Leasing Act, which is, uh, covers our, sub our surface leasing. So if we're going to lease our land for anything, right, business, ag, wind and solar, public, religious uses, doesn't cover subsurface, it's just surface. Then we go to the BIA to get approval. We have our right-of-way act for our roads, our transmission lines, our pipelines, our service line agreements for our infrastructure. Um, TERRAs, Tribal Energy Resource Agreements, this is um, specific to energy resources, so unlike Long-Term Leasing Act and Right-of-Way Act, which uh, will be used for energy development, TERRAs are specific to energy development. Um, this law was actually just amended in December to make it supposedly a little bit easier for tribes to enter into TERRAs, but to show how kind of complicated tariffs are and, and how confused people still are with implementing tariffs. Tariffs were originally authorized in 2005 in the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Um, zero tariffs in place. Um, in 2011, Congress passed and the President signed the Hearth Act. 45 Hearth Act regulations, 45 tribes now. So, we like to see the Hearth Act action taking place. It's all surface. Doesn't help downhole energy development. Terra's would. But maybe with the amendments, uh, we'll see the ability to use more tribal energy resource agreements for tribes on a broader scale. Um, we, of course, have our Indian, American Indian Land Consolidation Act, our Forest Management Act, the Agricultural Management Act. We have a whole host of environmental laws that we have to comply with when we go to the BIA. When the BIA has to approve a lease or right of way, they're compelled to comply with NEPA. Oh, is that my phone? Sorry about that. <laughs> that was to wake me up on the plane. Um, so we have a whole host of environmental laws we have to comply with, right? We have to comply with NEPA. We have to comply with NHPA. We might have to comply with the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. We might have to comply with um, Endangered Species Act. If we're doing big windmill projects, I see this beautiful windmill out here. It's, it's spinning. I didn't see any wind. Well, I, I didn't see anything blowing. So I'm wondering if the Shakopees are just spinning that thing to make it look like it works. Um, <laughs> but, um, but that windmill is, you know, we, windmills are going to take birds, birds, bats, and bees. So we might have uh, bird laws we have to worry about. So a whole host of environmental laws that we have to comply with, especially if we have the BIA involved. Um, but some we have to comply with nonetheless. So if we're trying to do energy development that's somewhere near a water course that might be a water of the U.S., we're looking at Clean Water Act. If we're doing any major construction, we're looking at Clean Air Act permits for dust control, these kinds of things. So we have to be considerate of what the feds require us to do. Uh, but we also have some abilities to take on some of that federal role. Uh, for example, the Hearth Act lets us do our own leasing without having to go to the secretary for approval. Terras also let us do our own leasing or other business agreements or right-of-ways for energy-specific projects without having to go to the secretary for approval. Both of those, however, require the tribe to have some type of environmental review process. So if you're a California tribe that has to do an environmental review ordinance and you've only limited to your casino, well, you can just take out gaming project and add any project, and now you've got it covered for hard fact purposes. So, um, so we have to have our own environmental review. If we do Clean Air Act or Clean Water Act treatment as state status, 
where we do our own, can do our own permitting, set our own standards and do our own permitting under both of those, then again, we don't have to go to the federal government to do that work. We keep it all in house. Nothing under treatment of state status requires us to do our own environmental review, unlike the Hearth Act, which does. We can permit, not necessarily with having to do environmental review. So, so there are ways to, one, take control of our development, and two, get the feds out of our business, which three, makes it faster, maybe easier, certainly less expensive for both the tribe and for um, folks you might be trying to uh, attract from the outside, outside investors, uh, to do projects. This is part of certainty as well. If we have tribal law that has replaced federal law with respect to environmental review and leasing, and we're trying to bring somebody in to lease our land, and they know they only have to deal with the tribe, one of the key things that keeps people away from doing business with tribes is um, not the tribe, it's the BIA. How long is it going to take the BIA to do an EIS? Who knows? Who knows? They get the lease, who knows? They're not going to complain about the lease. Now they're supposed to defer to us, thankfully, but they still have an obligation to double check us. So if we can do things to get the federal government out of our business, I think it's a huge leg up for us to take not just, again, full advantage of our sovereignty, but to create an environment where people are going to be more interested in investing because they know they're only dealing with us and not having to deal with um, our federal trustee. On the state and local government side, this is areas where tribes, a lot of tribes have uh, mirrored, if not exactly, certainly uh, in, in uh, kind of subject matter, what state and local governments do. So zoning laws, you can only do put housing here, you can't put housing there. We do land management planning, show of hands. A lot of tribes are finally starting to tax. Um, granted, they're taxing the casino business and everybody in the casino, but fine by me. I'll both take your, the money you put in the slot machine and the tax on top of the hot dog that you're buying. So um, taxation is important, business licensing and other business regulations, um, development regulations, permitting and fees. Uh, this is one area that I have not yet seen. There's a couple of big tribes outside of Phoenix that have these massive retail. Anybody here from Gila River or Salt River before I talk about them? Okay, so, so they have these massive retail schemes out there and kind of some minimal permitting requirements. I was a little shocked when you look at kind of what the, it creates a competitive advantage. Don't, just, don't get me wrong. There's a great way to create competitive advantage by minimizing the cost to do development on tribal lands. But you also don't want to leave money on the table. So if the county of Maricopa is charging somebody $50,000 to develop a particular area, and then, well, you should be charging them 40 instead of 10 or whatever it is. So, um, but we're starting to see more and more tribes kind of start to look at what the surrounding community is doing and positioning themselves in a way that creates some competitive advantage but also doesn't leave money on the table. And licensing, taxation, and permitting with associated fees um, is one way to do that. City and local governments, though, are also very concerned about infrastructure development, who pays for it, um, what infrastructure is required to, to be developed uh, when you do it. This is one of our biggest challenges, for example, with housing, right? We want to develop a housing project. We're waiting on IHS to give us the money for the water. We're waiting on the BIA to do God knows what. We're waiting on the utility company. If it's our own utility company, which there aren't very many of us, but if it is, God knows how long we're going to wait. But even if it's a co-op, we're really waiting a long time. So. This whole idea of who's responsible to develop the infrastructure, um, a lot of state and local governments say, you developer will build the infrastructure. We're not building it, you're building it. And, and you're going to pay us a development fee. So lots of ways to uh, skin a cat if we look at how other people are doing it. Um, and then lastly, state and local governments are uh, responsible for regulating utilities. Uh, both in terms of tariffs and customer service, et cetera. And these are some other ways that tribes can assert their sovereign authorities over utility providers and infrastructure development to try and achieve some of the goals they're trying to achieve. So as I said earlier, these are just some of the many, 
But I think some of the biggest benefits to kind of pre-positioning your legal infrastructure. One, tr again, transparency. If you're trying to go out there and attract people to come onto your reservation, the first thing I ask when I'm out there either working for a tribe or working for somebody who wants to do business with a tribe is, let me see your code. Let me see your constitution, let me see your code. I want to know what your court looks like. I want to know, because I want, when I'm, especially when I'm working for the tribe, right? I want to try and get tribal court jurisdiction. I want to get tribal law jurisdiction in any deal I make. But I can't do that if I don't have a court document that I can show people, if I don't have a body of law that I can point people to. So transparency is huge for especially outside development. It's also big for tribal members. If you're trying to encourage tribal members to, if, you, if they have their own allotted lands, assuming they can get their stuff together, you know, encourage development of tribal members. If you're trying to get tribal members to start businesses on the reservation and use tribal lands that are either assigned or, or leased to them, you want tribal members to also be able to see what laws they'll be subject to and what laws will be to their benefit or could be a challenge for them from an from a economic development standpoint. Um, the other benefit is it gives you some flexibility. So you put out your law and somebody comes to you and says, well, I'd be happy to do this, but this provision in the law is a bit of a challenge. So can we you know, get a change in law? Sure. I just had a client that just did that. They have somebody who's trying to negotiate a lease. They said, well, you know, we love this, this law, but there's one provision we think you need to have, then we'll feel comfortable saying yes to that term. So the tribal council adopted that provision, and they said yes to the term. So, and that all inured to the benefit of the tribe. So there's flexibility that ha this prepositioning also gives us, um, but it gives us a great deal of control. Again, we're, we're, being able, we're able to say to people up front, here's what our laws are, here's what you have to comply with. Some people might hem and haw, fine, then don't do business with us. Or, you know, if you can change this, then we're happy to do this $800 million deal, okay, we'll change that and we'll, we'll change the law to do that. But you're, but you're able to control that conversation because you've put that law out there. You're not hiding the ball. When you hide the ball, everybody's trying to guess kind of what's going to happen, including you, tribal staff, tribal council. Everybody's going to be guessing at what's going to happen. So this, this control creates this certainty as well. Um, you can also target your development. So a lot of tribes, if they don't have a master plan, they just kind of look around. And I'll tease my tribe about this. They're kind of looking around going, oh, let's put the housing over there. And I go, behind the pile, it's like a pile of rubble. <laughs> I go, behind the pile of rubble? They go, well, it's the only flat spot. So, you know, so there's some willy-nilly that can go on. But if you have a law in place, maybe it's a zoning law, maybe it's a land use law, maybe it's something that says, certainly, here's where our cultural sites are, here's where our sensitive sites are, so stay away. And we don't want anybody over here. We want everybody over here instead. So you can target your development based on what you're trying to accomplish, where you're trying to accomplish it, maybe what you're trying to protect. Um, and then lastly, and I think um, frankly most importantly, it in the end reduces costs. When people know what the law is, when they know what they have to comply with, when there's more certainty there, then they can plan. Their plan, will they will most likely stick to it because they're not guessing and you're not guessing and you're not negotiating along the way. Um, they know we've got to do this, 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 and this. And so they can plan for that. They can budget for that. And everybody, of course, we're going to have, you know, maybe unexpected surprises. But this is why nobody wants to deal with the BIA. Even though we have a process in place, nobody knows how long it's going to take. Nobody knows what this region is going to do versus that region. This realty officer might know a whole bunch of stuff about one thing, and this person doesn't. And so who knows what this person does? So... By having this prepositioned, everybody is a little bit more familiar with what has to happen, how long it should take to happen, what the costs are associated with that. And so in the end, it reduces our costs, and that means, it, and it reduces our development timelines. And if we're trying to do economic development, if we're trying to re raise revenue from this development process, or if we're trying to save some money, time is money. 
So when the BIA says, well, it might be three to five years to do an EIS for a 160 megawatt solar project or 160 megawatt wind project, you go, five years? Like I'm losing $3 million a year in rent. So why would we do that when we could do it ourselves and save some time and save some money? Okay, so if we're trying to understand how we would develop our legal infrastructure, again, going back to our organic laws, what are our tribal laws? Do we have anything around land use and zoning? Do we have anything around the environment? Tax laws, do we have, have we already identified areas of cultural significance or um, other no development zones? Do we have building codes? Do we have a building inspection department? If we're permitting people, collecting fees, that's helping to offset the cost of doing building inspections. That's what everybody else charges. Just doing some research in Sacramento County, you're paying $50,000 a year just for inspection services. So we don't have to incur all the expense ourselves. Folks are used to paying these expenses, so we should um, indulge them and charge them. So these are some of the things we can be looking at, we should be looking at. Um, leasing, uh, as I said earlier, the biggest barrier to leasing is federal approval. Um, so just a little bit more about the Hearth Act and how we get around federal approval using the Hearth Act. Um, allows tribes to lease lands, um, restricted lands is the technical definitions, restricted and trust lands, residential business, the usual purposes under 415 without the approval of the secretary, certainly gives us greater self-determination. We decide, first of all, we decide what part of the leases we want to adopt. We don't have to adopt it all. So this, the department has business, they have residential, they have agriculture, they have wind and solar, um, and then they have all other leases. So four basic, five basic lease types. When we do hearth act leasing regs, we can pick all or several or one. So we decide for ourselves what kind of leasing uh, a regime we want to take on. Um, so it lets us make those decisions. If we want to do it all, we do it all. If we want to do one, and I know lots, lots of tribes, three or four tribes that have done just the wind and solar lease part of the leasing, because they had big wind and solar projects, they didn't want to wait on the BIA. So they adopted the wind and solar lease, approve their leases, and projects are going. So, um, so we get to decide for ourselves. As soon as the secretary approves the leasing, the, the tribal regulations, um, tribes can process that land lease. Of course, it reduces the time uh, that it takes to approve leases, um, not only for homes, but for other business uh, development. Um, the Hearth Act actually stands for helping expedite, what does the A stand for? Something residential tribal housing. Helping expedite access to residential tribal housing, I think is what it stands for. And it was promoted by the, is that right? It sounds good, right? The letters are right. So, <laughs> um, typical feds, they're acronyms. Um, and the idea was because these, the tribal housing people couldn't get housing uh, leases get through, uh, through the BIA. So we all ended up benefiting they open the door for housing and we go, oh, great, we can put solar projects in this. And off we, off we are to the races. Um, so uh, exactly how does it work? You can execute uh, these leases for a primary term of up to 25 years, plus two renewal terms of 25 years. So that's the default position in the Leasing Act itself, the Long-Term Leasing Act. Some tribes have 99-year leasing authority under the statute. Um, but you only have 25-year leasing authority under the Hearth Act. So if you're a tribe with 99-year leasing authority and you wanted to do Hearth Act regulations, your leasing authority gets reduced to 25 years, plus 25 plus 25, so 75 years. Um, so you don't get the 99-year um, authority under the Hearth Act. Um, but that, that could be okay. I don't know who anybody's leasing for 99 years to, but... Um, if you're doing it to a solar project, that's a 30-year lease, 35-year lease, not much more. So you could do Hearth Act 25 plus 25 and have any solar project covered, any wind project, any big uh, um, ground lease is going to be no more than 20, 25 years. Uh, so most of the big stuff will be okay under this term, under this limit. Our leases of uh, tribal trust land for residential, recreational, religious, or educational purposes can go up to 75 years. And again, that's what the statute 
the, the default rule in the statute is, is 75 years for those purposes. Um, secretary has to approve the tribal leasing regs as long as they're consistent. This is a shall approve. As long as they're one, consistent with the DOI leasing regulations, and two, there's an environmental review process. And the act lays out the three or four things that the environmental review process has to cover. And it's basically, I call it NEPA-like, I'm not supposed to say that, but that's what I call it. For those of us who are more familiar with NEPA, so it's, you know, you gotta identify what the significant uh, effects might be, environmental impacts, you have to provide a notice and comment period to people to be able to comment on that, you have to respond to those comments, and you have to, you have to um, do uh, not full mitigation, but enough mitigation to say I've tried to do something to avoid these impacts. So a, a lot like uh, NEPA without all the NEPA baggage. Tribal regulations go to the Deputy Bureau Director at the BIA Office of Trust Services in DC. Um, and they're still moving forward on these. They're, they're approving them. They're not as fast as the last administration, um, but they're still moving forward on them. So the good news is they haven't stopped uh, letting us uh, do our own leasing. Um, as I said earlier, many tribes are adopting these tribal regulations for different purposes, so specifically wind and solar, which are a subpart there, businesses, uh, which can include everything uh, that's retail related uh, and then some, uh, including industrial uses, office space, etc. cetera. Um, what the Hearth Act does not authorize, at least from an energy standpoint um, and a mineral development standpoint, is the exploration, development, or extraction of mineral resources. So no subsurface stuff. So sand and gravel is a mineral resource covered by the Mineral Leasing Act, not covered by the Hearth Act. But everything on the ground is covered. Below ground or downhole, as we would call it, oil, gas, geothermal, not covered. And unfortunately, but maybe from a tribal member, fortunately, it doesn't cover a lot at lands. So a lot tees, um, still have to go to the BIA to get approval to lease a lot at lands. Uh, the tribe, if the tribe has its own Hearth Act regulations, it cannot approve leases on a lot at lands under those uh, leasing regs. What does the environmental review process have to look like? Again, identification and evaluation of the significant effects of the proposed lease, notice and comment that's related to the significant impacts, um, and then a response to relevant and substantive public comments prior to the tribal approval of the lease. So the other benefit of the Hearth Act that, um, that we have, even though we have to do this environmental review process, and there was a lot of consternation, terras require an environmental review process. So from 2005, we had this model in law that said, okay, you can do your own stuff, but you have to do environmental review. And under the terras, it's a very detailed set of requirements. It is, it is very NEPA-like um, under the terras. Um, on the Hearth Act, we said, well, you know, terras aren't working. We think this is too much. And quite frankly, this is all on reservation stuff. So if anybody's gonna complain, it's gonna be tribal members. Tribal council, tribal governments should already be pretty well understanding of what tribal community issues are. So we don't really need to have this elaborate review process in the law. Tribes wanna have an elaborate review process, they can do that. But that's for them to decide. It's their environment, let them decide. We, we shouldn't tell them what to do. So we tried to, but then we got some pushback. So we tried to kind of at least keep it to a minimum of the basic environmental review. One of the key things though that I think tribes are experiencing is um, we have now gotten away from some of the state and local government politics that we see when the federal government is approving our stuff. So when the BIA gets a lease from us, we know this from people who are putting land into trust, right? BIA gets a lease from us and they go out with it. Maybe it's a big massive project and they have to do an EIS. So they go into the NEPA process and they start notifying everybody. The state gets notified, the city and local governments get notified, any other interested stakeholders, everybody shows up to the scoping meeting. And next thing we know, the BIA is getting all this outside political pressure on what to do with our projects on our lands. So one of the other big benefits is even though we have to do our own environmental review, we don't have to pay any mind to what those folks have to say. We have to respond to them, 
if they submit comments, but we don't have to pay them any mind. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't pay them mind. Obviously, being a good neighbor is important, and we might have relationships with them that we want to maintain and those kinds of things, but we won't necessarily have the same kind of political pressure that can be asserted on the Department of the Interior. For those of you who have been following the trials and tribulations of our friends up in Connecticut, anybody familiar with that issue up there? So two tribes in Connecticut, the Mohegans and the Mashantuckets, get together. They decide to do an off-reservation casino. The state agrees. They have to do an amendment to their compact. They send their compact into the Department of Interior to be amended. The department first says okay, and then after massive lobbying by MGM, who's right across the state line of the Secretary of the Interior, Secretary says no, I'm not doing it. Next thing we know, he's under criminal indictment criminal investigation by the Department of Justice for that very decision. And now the BIAs reversed themselves and said, okay, now you can have it. That's the kind of outside pressure that is constantly being asserted against our trustee. So if we can get ourselves out of that political pressure vacuum and do our own stuff, then um, be, eat this little bit is probably worth it, I think. Okay. The other thing that um, our legal infrastructure lets us do, and this is a little, I'm going to get lawyerly now, is, you know, it's, it helps us make the argument that the state has no business in our business. So there's a law, um, it's, it's actually a Supreme Court case, um, White Mountain Apache versus Bracker, where the Supreme Court of the United States developed a test to try and decide whether state law applies on tribal lands. Now, we learned in Indian Law 101 that back in the 1830s, the Supreme Court says state law doesn't apply on tribal lands. In the Marshall Trilogy, we have this whole series of discussion about how Georgia can't assert any state law on Cherokee lands when the Cherokees were still in Georgia. Jump ahead 100-something years, and now the Supremes are saying, well, maybe state law does apply. So states are constantly trying to tax non-Indians on our lands. They're trying to regulate certain non-Indian activity, even though it's occurring on our lands. And in this Bracker uh, case, the state of Arizona was trying to tax a non-Indian trucking company that was hauling logs for Fort Apache uh, back and forth, just stayed on the reservation. So the Supremes come up with, uh, come up with a test that requires this look at kind of what the state is trying to do. And it combined a couple of ideas in the law around federal preemption, what are the federal interests, um, and what are the state interests. And it says, well, federal interest plus uh, tribal interest versus state interest. And if the federal and tribal interest outweigh the state interest, then the state law doesn't apply. Um, so that's our new test. That's what we have to deal with when we're trying to figure out whether the state can reach into the reservation and tax or otherwise regulate. So what the court looked at, and there are a couple of other cases that followed this right after this, was what's the federal law in place? What's the federal scheme that's in place? And that kind of represents the federal interest. And it can't be this nebulous interest. A lot of tribes go, oh, federal interest is self-determination. Not good enough for the Supremes. There's got to be something there. So what that something usually is is a federal legal scheme, a regulatory scheme. So in the case of Bracker, it was the federal laws around forest management. The BIA was running the forest. They hadn't 638 contracted it yet. The BIA was running the forest, all this stuff. And then it looked at the, state, the tribe's laws. Did the tribe have any laws that was regulating the activity? And in this case, for, the Fort Apache was regulating this timber activity. Um, and then it looked at the state laws. And of course, there's no state timber lands in the, on the reservation. There's no state law applying to the timber lands. All the state wanted to do was raise revenue. And the court said, that's not good enough, not good enough. But what, it's, what was the key thing in the, the uh, cases that followed is that there were tribal laws in place regulating this very activity. We see and we always lose this answer to this test when there is no tribal law. When the state says, I'm going to tax that, and the tribe goes, you can't tax that, and you look around and there's no tribal tax. So you go, what's the tribal interest? You're not doing anything. You're not taxing it. You're not regulating it. So what's the tribal interest? Self-determination. Not good enough. 
You have to actually be doing something here. So the other benefit of having this legal infrastructure is when the state tries to reach in and say, we're going to regulate that activity or we're going to tax that activity, you go, nope, we're already taxing it. We're already regulating it. Under a Bracker test, we win, not you. So if we don't have it in place, we always lose. There is not a single tribe that has won a Bracker analysis with zero tax or uh, regulation in place. So it helps us. Um, to win this activity, to win this, uh, win this uh, argument if we have to, if we have to make it. Um, it also helps us with asserting jurisdiction over non-Indians on tribal and fee lands. So how many people are here familiar with the Montana test? Oh, all you land folks. Got okay, so the Montana decision is the Crow Nation was trying to regulate hunting and fishing of non-Indians who lived within the exterior boundaries of the Crow Reservation, but they lived on non-Indian fee land. So we all have, many of us have checkerboarded lands, right? A bunch of non-Indian fee land in the middle of our reservation, owned by non-Indians. The default rule under Montana is the tribe lacks jurisdiction over them, unless there's two exceptions. One, they have a contract or some other consensual relationship with the tribe, or two, their activity poses a um, uh, uh, risk, and it's got to be significant, but a risk to public health, safety, welfare, economic welfare included, or um, political governance. So, um, so what tribes have been doing, and uh, a lot of tribes with checkerboarded lands are starting to catch up with this, is passing environmental laws um, and mostly because they get treatment of state status or they want to get treatment of state status under the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act. So they start passing environmental laws that apply to the exterior boundaries of the reservation, Indian and non-Indian alike, fee land and trust land alike, and then they make a bunch of statements in the law. They do like findings, like Congress does. And they find that, that air quality is a public health issue. They find, they make all these findings around that second exception of Montana. Public health, welfare, safety, political governance. And they make all these findings and then they argue that that law should apply to the non-Indians on non-Indian fee land because it's addressing public health and safety issues. So if we have legal infrastructure in place, we can make that assertion when the non-Indian says, you're not the boss of me, you can't regulate my activity, and we see that all the time. The tribe can point to a law and say, oh, yes, we can. Here's our law. Here's why what you're doing meets the second exception of Montana, if not the first exception. Depends on what the issue is. Um, the other issue uh, is related to trust land, right? So if we're releasing our trust land, how can we ensure that we have um, regulatory authority and are asserting it over non-Indians operating on our trust land? So the other Supreme Court case here is Marion. It's a Hickory Apache versus Marion, where the Supreme Court very clearly says tribes have inherent sovereign authority over their trust lands and can regulate economic activity on their trust lands, regardless of who is engaging in the activity. The Ninth Circuit just last week upheld the Marion um, formula for um, regulating non-Indian activity on tribal trust lands and having jurisdiction over non-Indians who are operating, in this case were employed, by the tribe on tribal trust lands. So having legal infrastructure in place that, again, is using our sovereignty to regulate the economic activity falls squarely in line with Marion, would be supported by the Marion line of cases, um, and a non-Indian can argue. Ninth Circuit's taken up this type of position now. I think there's four cases now that they've addressed in this very issue and have upheld Marion as giving tribes, or not giving tribes, affirming tribes' power uh, over non-Indians on uh, tribal trust lands. So um, the other thing to think about when it comes to developing legal infrastructure is um, you know, there, there are folks who are very fun. I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, I just have a question about the Montana exception. Um, can you clarify? Can you have to have a contract or agreement with the tribe to be owner on tribal land for that jurisdiction to apply? Or can you have a contract with the state to exert like plans? 
So the non-Indian has to have a consensual relationship. Oh, sorry. So the, the, the question was on the first exception of Montana, do you have to have a contract with the tribe directly? Or, be, or, or can you have a contract with the state? Um, and so the, the formula is, the, the legal formula is you have to have a consensual relationship with the tribe or its members. The individual, the individual property owner. So, um, so and, and frankly, that's a little hard to do. Um, you know, if the tribe, for example, is, has a utility and the utility is providing utility service to the non-Indian on non-Indian fee land, then they would have a consensual relationship with the tribe and the tribe would have jurisdiction over that person such that, let's say, they didn't pay their utility bill, they could haul them into tribal court. Um, conversely, if you had a utility that was, that was a non-tribal utility and they have a bunch of right-of-ways on Indian land, right, to service the tribal members, then you could argue that utility, that non-Indian utility, has a consensual relationship with the tribe, and therefore the tribe has jurisdiction over that utility who's providing electricity service, and there are a handful of tribes who have utility regulations, and they sound those regulations in the consensual exception of Montana. They also sound it in the second one, public health, because they go, oh, you know, it's cold up here, so you can't cut off our power. That's right, and you could, you certainly would have, um, you know, if somebody comes to you with a building permit, every permit I draft has a provision in there, I am consenting to the tribe's jurisdiction. So, um, so we've all learned, lawyers are all learning, you got to put all these magic words and agreements and everything, because some courts will say, well, it's not, an, you have to have an explicit consent. Like, they have to know and voluntarily consent. They can't, it's just not enough to have a, a, an, a contract. So now we just add the provision in. I consent, right? And then we don't have to argue about it. Yes, ma'am. So, so the question is, or the issue is, um, they're doing a joint um, highway construction project. The highway is on, is it an existing highway? So you're just updating the road? And the road is on a right of way that's sitting on top of trust land. And the state wants to apply its own taxes to the construction contract, right? They have some kind of privilege tax or something on construction. Or, and you want to you wanna tax them. So, um, so there is a case that has followed Montana. It's called um, Straight versus A1 Contractors. And in that case, the Supreme Court said that right-of-ways, and especially highway right-of-ways, are the equivalent of non-Indian fee land. Even though that in that, that case, the right-of-way, like your right-of-way, was on trust land. It was a state highway. Um, in, their, in, that, in, their, in the case of straight, it was an indefinite right-of-way. There, no there was no limit to that right-of-way, no term. So it was a perpetual right-of-way, and the Supreme said, well, this is really more like non-Indian fee land because the tribe doesn't have any control. They don't exercise any control. It's a perpetual right-of-way. You know, it, the state's maintaining the road, they built the road, they're maintaining the road, so the tribe doesn't really have anything to do with it other than own the underlying land. So the Supreme said that's, that's non-Indian fee land. Um, so it has become almost what we would call black letter law. Anytime you see a highway right of way, and if it's not a BIA road or a tribal road, if it's a federal road or a state road or a county road, then we say that's not Indian fee land. We don't even bother with the analysis. We just, everybody just concedes that it's not Indian fee land. So because of that, the state can tax. The tribe would have no taxation authority over that. So in the, the Supremes held in Atkinson versus uh, 
Shirley Atkinson Trading Post out of, out of Navajo, that Navajo Nation tried to tax a little uh, trading post that was sitting on non-Indian fee land right in the middle of the Navajo reservation. And they tried to assert a hotel tax and a sales tax on it. And the Supreme said, nope, non-Indian fee land owned by a non-Indian, you have no jurisdiction over this. So, so you would not win that argument if you had to litigate it. You'd be better off trying to split the tax. <laughs> No. no, not from you, because it's on non-Indian land. <laughs> I mean, do they have to cross any Indian land to get to that road? Probably not, right? They get to it. Are they using any of your land? Is there like a side temporary right of way off to the side that they're using for staging? Yes. Oh, well, there you go. Limited use permit, $50,000. <laughs> That's what I charge. That's my minimum charge. We'll go from there. Yeah, that's how you do that. Okay. Minimum, a, a limited use permit, temporary use permit. You don't even have to go to the BIA for that, right? Less than seven years. Do the permit, charge them a fee, make up the number. They won't know. Figure out what the county does. Then make them pay you. Then just send a copy to the BIA. That's how that works. I just did one of those. Would you have to do it right away? No, not if it's temporary use. If they just need it for staging, Right, so they're just staging along the highway for construction, and they're gonna, once, once they're done with construction, they don't need it anymore. That's just temporary use. Just keep it less than seven years, and you don't need the BIA's approval. And just charge them, just make up a number. I don't know what the number is, $50,000. Yes, ma'am. So there's a law in the books. Um, it used to be called the Indian Contracting Act. Um, it's part of, originally part of the um, Trade and Intercourse Act from 1790 that required the Secretary of the Interior to approve contracts with tribes. In 2000, that was amended, and um, yeah, 2000. So up until 2000, anybody entering a contract with a tribe literally, legally had to get it approved by the Secretary. Um, but in 2000, it was amended, and it was, became limited to um, contracts that uh, I think the term is um, encumber Indian land. Nobody knows what that means. For more than seven years, then you have to go get the secretary's approval. So, but it doesn't cover leases and it doesn't cover right of ways because those are also encumbrances of Indian land. So we don't know what it means. Well, for the most part, it's mortgages, we think, um, those kinds of things. So if you do a temporary permit that's using Indian land, it's temporary, they don't get any real property rights out of it. You can charge them whatever you want, whatever you negotiate. You don't have to get a BIA approval as long as it's less than seven years. And then um, you're good to go. No environmental reviews, no nothing. Just do it yourself. Make sure they consent to your jurisdiction. Put that provision in there. I'll be happy to send you a draft document if you want. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Okay, so that's how we have jurisdiction over non-Indians and non-Indian fee land. Also, temporary use permits, great idea. I love that, I love those ideas. Okay, um, another thing to think about, and this isn't really governmental in nature, except that um, a lot of times when tribes wanna get into the business development business themselves, and you know, our folks, our friends at Harvard always tell, how much time do I have, by the way? Does anybody know? What time are we supposed to be done? What time? How many? We're supposed to be done at 5? 4.30. So I have 20 minutes. Is that right? I didn't change my time, so I don't know what time it is. Um, okay, so, so tribes want to get into the business of business themselves. So one of the big challenges that tribes have is, according to the Harvard Project, separating business from politics getting tribal governments out of the business of business and into the business of governing. So one way, one other thing to think about from a development perspective, legal infrastructure perspective, is almost a market structure perspective or a transaction structure. And that would be to create a separate entity that is the one in charge of doing the development. So there's a lot of tribes who have economic development authorities um, who have Section 17 corporations that may be the tribal council or tribal government has 
um, assigned land to the Section 17, and the Section 17 goes out and does the development. Um, or it's a tribally chartered enter entity that is doing the development, gets the land assignment, and is told, go forth and develop. Good example of this um, in Arizona is Gila River. They have uh, an organization called WIPTA, uh, Wild Horse Pass Development Authority. Uh, the tribe gave WIPTA, I don't know, a few thousand acres. Their casino is sitting out there. The premium outlet mall is sitting out there. The uh, Firestone Raceway with a big water pool thing. They go, big boats go around and uh, car racing. They have uh, an industrial center. They've got um, a truck development company. I think Tesla was thinking about going out there for a minute. So WIPTA was basically given all of this land and told to go forth and develop it. And that's what they do. Tribal government, if they have to approve the lease, depends on what the lease terms are, then that only then is when it comes to council. But what council focuses on instead is passing laws to regulate those businesses and ensure that those businesses are operating consistent with the way the tribe wants them to operate. Um, and they leave the business development effort to WIPTA. So some other ways to think about creating a legal infrastructure that creates a separate entity that, especially if you're trying to attract outside investment and you want to separate business from politics and making those decisions, then you hand it off to a development authority or a section 17 or a separate uh, entity that's charged with doing the development. And then you apply, you worry about, you as the government worry about tribal laws, you as staff worry about implementing those laws and regulating and administering and doing all those things to make sure people are following the law. Okay, so real quick, best practices and practice models. Um, obviously every tribe has to assess its own needs. Um, and those needs might be related to leasing, might be related to other development. They might decide whether self-regulation can benefit the tribe. You have to look at, of course, what that costs, because it's not cheap, not free. The BIA is not going to give you any money for it. When you do Hearth Act regulations, you're not taking, you might, might be able to 638 contract the realty, some of the realty services, uh, but they're not going to give you any money to do the EISs. Now, the good news is the people doing the development will pay for the EIS. So, so there's lots of ways to defray those costs, at least uh, get them off of the tribal government's back. Um, but each tribe's got to make this assessment. Um, and, and part of that's policy, and that's why planning and understanding where the tribe's trying to go um, is so critical. What kind of economic development activities are appropriate? And then how do we encourage investment and development in our tribal community? So a lot of times, if we don't have a tax structure, Right? We can uh, brag about no taxes. If we do have a tax structure, then we can brag about cheaper taxes. You know, maybe it's not the same tax rate as the surrounding community. Um, even if it's the same rate, maybe we can say, well, you know, we'll defray taxes. Right? Can't, local governments do this all the time. They create these tax increment financing um, authorities where they'll say to a company, come on in and we'll, we will abate your taxes for five years while you get off the ground, and after that, we'll start charging you a tax. So lots of ways to try and incentivize uh, development. And if tribes are taking control of their sovereign authorities and developing laws that will encourage that, people can see that, and they'll know that that's what's available, and then they can react to it. What kind of entity might we want to develop um, to conduct our business? Uh, we don't necessarily want our tribal council trying to make development, business development decisions or trying to make, um, you know, it's one thing to make a land use decision and say, here's where the industrial park is going to go. It's another thing to say, okay, we want, we don't want this company, but we want that company. And maybe the council can do that in some ways, but you don't really want the council necessarily to be the one trying to vet the lessee, right? If you can get somebody else who is um, more qualified to do that in some cases, or certainly has the time to do it, tribal council's got a lot of stuff going on, right? So, so we don't want to necessarily give this development short shrift um, if we can pass it off to somebody who can help us do this. The other big reason to consider having an outside entity, a separate entity do this is, um, you know, you get into a big lease with somebody for your land, you know, they're going to want to be able to resolve disputes. 
They're not going to make you a lease payment of $3 million a year, whatever the number might be, and then if they get in a dispute with you, you go, sorry, immune, right? So tribal governments, very rightly so, very judicious with their sovereign immunity. You have a separate entity, it can waive its sovereign immunity till the cows come home, and the tribal government won't necessarily care because it's not on the hook for what that other entity is doing. So there's another benefit in that it mitigates risk to the tribal government, it separates risk from the tribal government and from this other entity, and it allows the other entity to enter into business terms and conditions for leases or right-of-ways or other agreements or contracts um, without posing uh, an inordinate risk to the tribal government itself. So you have the ability to resolve disputes. If you can resolve disputes, you're going to be able to make a deal. If you can't resolve disputes, nobody's going to want to make a deal with you, no matter how great a deal you're going to make them. Um, and then lastly, you know, you're going to have somebody who's going to be able to make sure environmental requirements are met. Um, a fourth kind of best practice or practice model to consider is um, what I've kind of labeled a landscape level environmental review. This is one area where um, our friends at the BLM do a pretty good job. We may not agree with what they decide to do, but they do a pretty good job when they do their big land use plans. So every BLM unit do you guys have any BLM land out here? It's all out west, I think. So every BLM unit has to do a land management plan or a land use plan. And they basically do this landscape level environmental review. They do a massive programmatic environmental, uh, sometimes a programmatic EIS. So usually it's a programmatic environmental assessment. But they go out there and they look at that whole landscape and they do all the, all the major environmental review work up front. One of the benefits of doing that, especially if you have a relatively small land base um, or if you have an area of the land base that you know you want to concentrate on and you do kind of this landscape review in the beginning, is that if, again, you're trying to attract outside investors or if even, you know, yourself, you're trying to do something, you've done all that groundwork, you've let, you understand what the baseline is, and then it's just incremental environmental review work from there. If you're trying to attract outside investors, you can go, hey, you know, we're trying to, we want to do a big solar project out here. Here's our landscape environmental review of the 3,000 acres that are available for solar development. And so they can see, okay, here's what's out here. We know what's out here. We know we might need to do some additional work. We might need to make sure we know exactly what's out here in this place or this place. But it gives people a leg up, gives you a leg up. Um, and it lets people know what's out there and it reduces their cost, right, and gives them a little bit more certainty. Um, Adopt our own laws. These are the major areas around uh, uh, resource development and land development. Um, I'm a big fan of the Hearth Act. I think every tribe, whether you use it or not, I think every tribe should go out there and just, it doesn't take anything. There's 50 tribes that have done it. Just ask somebody you know who's done it. Say, send me your Hearth Act regulations that gotten approved by the BIA, find and replace, and just send it in. Just send it in. Because as soon as something comes up, now you're prepared to act. If you, if you wait for something to come up and then decide, oh, we want to do the Hearth Act, then you got to go through that process. you got to wait. So just, it's just another prepositioning. Get it done. Put it on the shelf. Pull it out when you need it. And then you're ready to go. Um, and then lastly, um, especially around leasing or right-of-ways or temporary use permits, I've done a lot of form development. So here's our lease form. It's the same lease form for everybody. Maybe I change, you know, kind of what the purpose is. Maybe I have a cafeteria style menu. If it's, you know, this kind of a project, I'm gonna have these three clauses. If it's this kind of a project, I'm gonna have these four clauses. You can do all that. Um, it just makes it so much easier. Again, certainty, consistency. You're not reinventing the wheel. As much as I love to make money and build, do billable hours, I'd rather just pull out a form and check a box for my client than to have to keep rewriting a lease over and over and over again. So form leases, form right-of-ways, and, and on the right-of-way, remember the department, the secretary is the one signing the grant, the easement grant. But you, the tribe, are negotiating an easement agreement separate from the grant. So your easement agreement for a right-of-way is your consent to that right-of-way. That's required under the law. 
that the tribe consent to the right-of-way grant. The secretary is actually executing the grant, not the tribe. But the tribe should execute an easement agreement. And the secretary will then incorporate that easement agreement into the grant terms, which now makes that easement agreement federally enforceable. But when you're negotiating an easement agreement, if you know you're going to be doing some activity that's going to require a series of easements, one form easement agreement. Change your name, change your amount, change the legal description. That's always an exhibit anyway. And if you have temporary use permits and you want to use temporary use permits as a way to ensure that you have some control over what people are doing that need to use your land on a temporary basis, no matter what it's for, and you want to collect some money, a form permit. And it's all, it's all a lot easier to do. You get to you know, put in your consent. You get to lay out your dispute resolution. This is what we're going to agree to. We're not negotiating anything else. I will waive, but only to this extent, whatever you decided to do. And you can make sure you've got all the right applicable law as well. OK, so we've got a few minutes. Ooh, I blasted through that. What time? It, it's, uh, it's only 2.30 my time, so I'm still Still a little fresh. Um, any questions? Any other questions? I think this presentation is going to be available. I saw a bunch of people taking pictures. I can always email it to you if you want. Yes, ma'am. I've got a I've got a card. I'll give you a card. Do I have my Did I put my contact number? Oh yeah, here it is. Uh, here's my contact information as well. Easier to call me on my cell. I'm never in my office. Don't call me after April 2nd either. I'll be, I got knee surgery coming up, so I'll be um, on the painkillers, which means I can't, can't practice law for a couple of weeks. So call me before April 2nd, and I'll get you that form. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh. Oh, you don't want to, you don't want to take that with you? You might change your mind after you use the bathroom. Yes, I think it, that's what I was told, that the presentation's on the thumb drive. So my tribe has a problem with we have a, a tribal land use ordinance, but they're so outdated. You know, there's like 20, 30 years out, and it really needs to be revamped with today's regulations to be able to incorporate all these. And do you have any advice on how to kind of give counsel on board with that? Because they're so gun shy of adopting these regulations. They don't want to over-regulate themselves, but they also don't like change. So the question was, um, if I have an existing um, land use plan or land management plan that's 20, 30 years old, um, some thoughts on how to encourage council to revisit that when it needs to be updated. Um, you know, I think part of the challenge, of course, for councils are, um, uh, you know, they want to they make sure, uh, to your point, that they're not over-regulating. Um, but you also have to, I think, sometimes pose the lost opportunity as the reason for why they should make a change. So, um, you know, if there's, a, if there's a proposed opportunity to develop on a part of the reservation and the land use plan just doesn't allow for that development, but you know that that's the best thing to do out there and maybe there's some information that helps with that, you know, it's some, it's, sometimes it's just a pure sales pitch, right? It's just a pure, just kind of keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Um, until they understand or find the time uh, to do it. I don't know if your council is, you know, the kind of council that will just say yes to just about anything. If, okay, well, I was going to say you could just slide it in. Just slide it onto the agenda. <laughs> Here, we've got this updated land use plan. Um, or, you know, at least it's a, maybe it's a, hey, look, let's just start talking to the community and see, you know, what the community wants to do. And you just start building some kind of grassroots support for that. For so, I've had a couple of clients, and when I was at DOE, I saw this a lot, where um, similar challenges, and we encourage tribes to do energy planning by starting to talk to their tribal members. And what do your tribal members want to do around, say, rooftop solar or energy efficiency? and start to hold some meetings with tribal community members around those types of things. And the next thing you know, everybody's getting all excited, and then the, the council's got to do something, right? Because now their voters are interested in it. So that's the other way around it. I don't know. Hopefully that won't get me excommunicated.
That's right. That's right. You can you can cut and piece to say if I just want to do the approval because the, the agency superintendent takes forever. All I want is the contract to do the approval and the DI and do everything else. It's all or all we want to do is the environmental. That's something Travis. I don't think Travis is taking advantage of that because they just think we're going to have to take on all this. But in reality, you, you don't. You can only take on what you're willing to take on. That's right. So the so the point was made that um, even if you adopt Hearth Act regulations. If you get a lease that's, say, really big and you don't really want to do all that work or you're concerned or the lessee's concerned, you can still send it to the BIA for them to approve it. So you don't have to run all of your leases through. If you say you got took over the, BIA, the business leasing, you don't have to run all of your leases through. The BIA is not going to say, I don't know, you have hard fact, we're not going to do it. They'll take it um, if you send it to them. Um, and then the other comment was you don't have to do the whole soup to nuts part of it either. The benefit, of course, of doing soup to nuts is you control soup to nuts. Um, and so even if you agree to do just the environmental and you let the BIA do the approval, you're still waiting on them or vice versa. And they can't do the, the approval without doing their own version of the environmental. So even though uh, the leasing regulations say that they will use environmental review documents that have been produced by the tribe, they still have an independent legal obligation under NEPA and the NEPA regulations to do their own environmental review. Now, it doesn't mean they have to do the whole process again, but they have to do enough of it to say, okay, I'll accept that document. So you don't, they don't get to, they, they don't, even if you wanted to them just do the approval, they are, that approval requires them to comply with NEPA. So there's, there's not much benefit, I don't think, to splitting that up, maybe, BIA does the NEPA and I do the approval, but then you're still waiting on the, that's the hardest line. That's the, that's what takes the longest is the NEPA process. So you're better off just doing it yourself and getting it all done. Tribes can do it in six months. NEPA doesn't take that long when you get somebody else to do it. Just takes three years when the BIA does it for no good reason. So anyway, that's my pitch. Okay. Any other questions? No? Very good. I'm keeping you guys from your evening cocktail. Hopefully I'll see you over at the reception. Have a good rest of the conference. Thank you very much for your time.